Well, good afternoon, folks. It's uh, Brian Robson here, the Executive Clinical Director at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And welcome to this, the third in our exciting lineup of QI Connect WebEx series for 2015. The 13th uh, since we started the series at the beginning of last year. This series came from a request from our national clinical leads here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland to connect frontline clinicians interested in quality improvement with international leaders in the field of improvement. They ask that we make the sessions short, accessible and recorded to allow access at a time that suited them. I'm going to hand you over to Jennifer now, who's going to say a little bit more about the technology WebEx and how you can get the most out of this call. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Thanks, Brian, and good afternoon to everyone on the call. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping slides to get us started. If you can use the chat function that you see on the right-hand side of the screen, and to communicate, and I'll talk you through this in just a moment. Um, if you are having any technical difficulties, such as not being able to hear the presenter speak, or if you keep losing connections, then please message the event manager using the chat function, um, or call the number, or press star zero on your telephone. Um, so just some WebEx orientation for you. On the right-hand side of the screen, you should see a list of everyone who's joined the call. If you wish to make a comment or join the conversation in the chat box, please select all participants from the drop-down list, and that's circled in red on the screen. Type your message and then just click send. So before we begin, um, we just actually want to be able to identify where some of our participants are dialing in from. So this is this one interactive part of this session. So if you can just all click on the blue arrow at the top left hand screen and just click on the country you're linking in from. Welcome to Camila in Brazil. Fantastic. Okay, so I'll just pass you back to Brian. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone uh, for taking part in that, that small exercise. Welcome to the call. Uh, now we're going to continue with the uh, with the uh, uh, use of WebEx, and we're going to be testing your skills. As you know, this is an international collaboration, and we now have uh, 42 countries who signed up for our talks, and we have 10 countries live on the call this afternoon. What we'd like you to do is, again, using that blue... Uh, can it, thank you very much, Adil. Uh, the blue uh, marker at the top left hand of the screen. I'm going to call out a flag, and we have a prize for the for the uh, person that gets first to the flag I'm a, of the country that I'm about to shout out. I'll tell you about the prize just in a moment, but it's really exciting. So we'd like the first blue flag on Brazil. Ah, Nanita! Wow, that was fast. Great, thank you very much. Well done, Maureen and Nigel also. But Nanisa Fielding, that was uh, red hot, even before Camila, as Camila says, and <laughs> uh, Camila's from Brazil. So thank you very much for that. Uh, now the prize is a book, and I'll tell you more about that book just as we go on in the call, just in a moment. But that book's winging its way to you, uh, Nanisa, uh, just next week. Now, the other aspect as well as being international is the number of organizations. We now have more than 246 organizations signing up for the QI Connect series. When we first started, this was a slide with all of the images. We now have to go not just one slide, not just two slides, not three, not four, five slides of organizations that are now signing up for uh, QI Connect. So there's obviously something attractive in coming together to discuss and be connected in with international quality improvement leaders. And a special mention, as always, to our university uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, we are delighted that this has really appealed both to students and faculty at now more than 22 organizations. And a big shout out to the University of Edinburgh and the University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, who are two uh, new universities joining us on this call. And also a special mention to a number of new organizations who are joining us for the first time on this call, including ProQualis uh, there in Brazil and our friend Camila, who we've already seen in the chat function. We'll hear more from Camila and ProQualis later on on today's call. 
And again, we're delighted to have colleagues from all around the world, including our friends in Middlemore and Koawatea in New Zealand. Uh, given our global reach and the challenges that this brings in terms of time zones, we record all of our sessions and make them available on Healthcare Improvement Scotland's website. And this is a photograph of some of our colleagues at Koawatea in New Zealand bringing staff together for their lunch and learn sessions. So welcome to our friends from all over the world who will be uh, joining us uh, either live or at lunch and learn sessions. Again, we're delighted to have the International Society for Quality Improvement, the ISQA, uh, fellowship program recognizing QI Connect as one of their approved resources within the ISQA fellowship program. And remember, we're on Twitter. We're really keen to see the tweets flying. We know this is an excellent medium and uh, delighted that, that both our speaker today and Jennifer Graham have really, have really been ramping it up on this occasion. So hashtag HISQI Connect. That's the hashtag to use. And just a big thank you to our QI Connect team, uh, Jennifer, who you've already heard from, Carmen Forrest, and Ross Stewart. And today we're joined by uh, Michelle De Felici, uh, who is uh, joining us, uh, standing in for Ross Stewart. Uh, welcome to the uh, call today, uh, Michelle. And also delighted, and you'll hear more from, or you'll hear from uh, Laura Ryan later in the call. Uh, as you know, we set up these sessions and uh, primarily aimed at our um, national clinical leads and SPSP, the Scottish Patient Safety Program Fellows. And Laura is a fellow of that program and Laura will be asking the first question of our speaker. And welcome to Laura. So here is our Thank speaker. You, Brian. Welcome, Laura. Uh, we are, our speaker today is the Professor and Associate Chair of Department of Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. He's the author of more than 250 articles and more than six books. In addition to his many contributions in the field of quality improvement, he's generally considered the father of the hospitalist field, the fastest growing specialty in the history of modern medicine. He's a past president of the Society of Hospital Medicine and a past chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine. And his new book featured here, The Digital Doctor, Hope, Hype and Harm at the Dawn of Medicine's Computer Age, will be published by McGraw-Hill in April 2015. And in fact, it's a copy of that book that Nanisa Fielden has won uh, on today's uh, QI Connect. So uh, with, it's with great pleasure that I say, welcome, Bob. Thank you, Brian. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's actually an honor. I'm uh, very fond of your organization. I've spent a significant amount of time in, uh, in Scotland and the UK and have always admired the work that you do and the commitment to excellence, and I'm also an addicted golfer, so I'm particularly fond of your country. Thank you very much, Bob. Now, Bob, I've handed over the ball, and we'll look forward to your talk. Great, thank you. So uh, let me go ahead and get started. The, uh, the topic of my talk today is computerization uh, and the digitization of healthcare. I think an extraordinarily interesting an important topic and one that I've really been thinking deeply about for the last couple of years. Uh, let me give you a, uh, a couple of caveats and, and cautionary notes before I start. It's traditional to talk about conflicts of interest on the part of the speaker, and I clearly have one. I'd love all of you to be inspired enough to uh, think about uh, taking a look at the book uh, when I'm done, and I think it is now available on Amazon, at least, uh, at least in the U.S., I don't know about the rest of the world, but I'm hoping so. Um, the second caveat before I get into it is that uh, I am the furthest thing in the world from a Luddite. I believe deeply in computerization, and I think part of what has happened to us is uh, two twin expectations that have not been fully met. One is for those of us who've been working in patient safety for the last 10 or 15 years, we have seen computerization <clears throat> as the cure to many of the problems that we've seen. And I don't know about all of you, but I can, there are so many meetings that I've been at where we talked about medical mistakes, and we said if we just had computers, this wouldn't have happened. And so when computers finally entered our world, I think we were uh, quite, quite uh, normally uh, and expectedly uh, excited about it and feeling like this was going to solve many of the problems that we'd seen. And clearly it has solved many of those problems. I don't want to leave you feeling like 
computerization is making things worse on average. I think that there's no question in my mind that having a good digital system makes things better and safer than they are without it. But I have been also quite impressed by the unanticipated consequences and, in fact, some new errors and new error types that we've seen uh, because of computers. And I think that's really uh, why I've gotten interested in this. The other uh, thing, not only have we been somewhat disappointed in the worlds of safety and quality because we've been looking forward to this for, for so long, uh, but the second thing I think is we've been spoiled by our iPhones. I think you know all of us now have become so used to how dazzling technology is in the rest of our lives that we expected that computerization in healthcare would be similarly wonderful and magical and similarly uh, straightforward. And maybe if Apple had done it, it would have been, but it's certainly not been my experience, nor I think the experience of many clinicians or quality improvement uh, workers, uh, that it has been that magical or that easy. I think we've been all uh, surprised by some of the stumbling blocks. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. But I think the bottom line and the message I'll get to at the end is not that we should pull out the wires and go back to pen and paper, uh, or if you're not yet computerized, you should stall out your computerization efforts. But we have to be much more thoughtful about the way we've done it and much more cognizant about some of the potential uh, uh, speed bumps that we're seeing along the way. I want to tell you the story of uh, how this has happened in the United States. This will be relevant to some extent to, to various of you, depending on what country you're in. Uh, when I was in the UK uh, in 2011 for the year on a Fulbright, uh, it was just at the time that, the, the, at least in England, the NHS was declaring the uh, $15 uh, billion, I think about a $10 billion pound investment in computeriz computerizing the NHS as a failure and basically starting over again. So uh, federal policies, national policies to try to computerize are hard to do and failures are actually quite common. In the U.S., I'll tell you a little bit about how this happened in the United States. So what you see on this slide is uh, uh, two gentlemen. On the left side is David Brawler. David Brawler became the first director of the national office that was set up by the uh, government to help promote computerization in healthcare. Uh, he started his job in 2004, and his initial budget allocated by the Congress to computerize the American healthcare system was $42 million. So he had $42 million to try to transform the $3 trillion U.S. healthcare system into a digital system. Uh, that would be the equivalent of trying to change the direction of a battleship by putting your feet into the ocean and kicking very hard. Uh, really very hard to do with $42 million. In 2009, David Blumenthal, who you see on the other side of the screen, became the head of the Office of the National Coordinator. And his budget to computerize the American healthcare system was $30 billion with a B. Uh, that's a 71,000% increase. The backstory of how that happened is interesting. You might guess it. The reason it happened was in 2008, our economy imploded. The uh, Congress allocated $700 billion to rescue the economy. And uh, the, the mantra around uh, here was that uh, the projects that were going to be funded with that $700 billion were what were called shovel-ready project and what they were talking about were, were roads and bridges, but several leaders, including David Blumenthal and others, saw a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to find money to, to promote computerization. They dove into that $700 billion money pile, came out with $30 billion, and over the last five years, we've been distributing that money to doctors and to hospitals for implementing computer systems that met certain federal requirements called meaningful use. And it has essentially worked. And here's the curve you see of physicians that achieved the standards that allowed them to uh, receive the incentive payments. And, and there, these, co these, pro these uh, programs, as you might guess, have been somewhat controversial, but particularly as compared with the experience that they had in England with the federal program. In the U.S., I think the program largely met its goals, the goals being to switch the American healthcare system from analog to digital, in 2008, about 10% of doctors' offices and about 10% of hospitals were uh, use electronic health records. By last year, that number was up to 70%. That's why this is such a particularly interesting issue now and why I chose to spend a year or so writing about it, thinking about it, and interviewing about 100 people uh, from various, uh, who were various stakeholders in this, 
because this really is a watershed moment in American healthcare and I think healthcare more broadly. We really are switching from one way of doing our work, which is pen and paper, to a completely different way of doing our work, which is digital. Now, let me tell you about a couple of the, the things that I noticed that got me to thinking that this has not gone as smoothly as we would have guessed. This is Rich Barron, who is now the CEO of the American Board of Internal Medicine, but prior to that was a primary care doctor, was a GP in a four-person practice outside of Philadelphia. And Rich is kind of an early adopter type, and he chose about 10 years ago to computerize his four-person office. And he did it, and they were excited about it, and they, one day they implemented the system, I think uh, ironically or fittingly, on Bastille Day, as it turned out. And Rich told me that the staff came to work one day, and nobody knew how to do their job. It was a very telling comment, and it's, I think it says something quite deep about this, that, that although we tend to think about computerization as simply being another mechanism to practice medicine or nursing or, or, or whatever you do, it's not. It so fundamentally changes the nature of the practice that the work is completely transformed, and to do it effectively, the work has to be reimagined. I'll come back to this a little bit later, but I think this was one of the mental flaws that we had in computerization. We thought of it as just simply replacing what we were doing and whatever our work processes were. We would simply keep doing those processes now in a digital environment rather than an analog environment. I think that turns out to be a flawed approach uh, to this. Now, you might say, well, okay, good. We will think about all of this before we go digital. And I asked Rich about that, and Rich said, they, the vendor said that to us. We should try to reimagine our work in a digital environment, but you can't do it. It's too hard to do to, to even think about what the workflow will be like before you go digital. And so, of course, what we should be learning is learning from each other and those who've gone before us. But the, the quote I always come back to is something Henry Ford was reputed to have said, which is, he said, uh, if, I had, if I asked people uh, what they really wanted and needed, they would have said faster horses. It's very difficult for people to imagine this fundamentally different world, and I think that's what we found ourselves in, a very new world of healthcare and one that we underestimated the complexity of. Here's a second example of something that told me that something very interesting was going on and, and, and that this was harder than it looks. I had an op-ed in the New York Times last weekend where I started it with this case. This is a 2014 advertisement for an emergency uh, department, emergency medicine job for a physician at a hospital in Arizona. And it says Arizona Hospital is coming to the state later this year. It's located in a suburb of Phoenix. It's a boutique general hospital. Sounds pretty good. And here's what the ad said. It said the services include, they have an ER, which is nice if you're looking for emergency room physicians. It'd be uh, sort of a problem if you didn't have an ER. They have a radiology suite with all the fancy toys. They had state-of-the-art operating rooms, outpatient surgery, 16 inpatient rooms. All sounds pretty good so far, but there was only one part of the ad that was in bold. It said they have no electronic medical record. So in 2014, a hospital saw fit to advertise for a new doctor by touting the fact that you can still use pen and paper here. And this really is a metaphor for something that we're seeing, which is pretty widespread clinician disappointment and disenchantment with life in a digital environment. So as I've said, we've been waiting patiently for healthcare IT, but we've been seeing uh, really uh, some really interesting and important problems that have emerged. I want to highlight three of them for you. We don't have that much time, so I'll go quickly. I want to be sure we have time for discussion. We can discuss many and more of these issues. But I'm going to talk about digital radiology as the canary in the coal mine. I'm going to talk about the eye patient. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. And then I'm going to spend much of my time talking about a single error that happened at my own hospital about two years ago that, was, that really brought to light the idea that IT, information technology, as you call it, ICT, can certainly solve many of the problems in patient safety, but it could also create new ones that I think we were unprepared for. Let me start with digital radiology, and I'll tell you why I think this is interesting. So, uh, as I've mentioned already, in American healthcare, we needed about $30 billion of federal money to provide incentives for doctors and hospitals to computerize. 
But there was one segment of American medicine that went digital about 10 years before the rest of medicine without any federal prompting, and that was radiology. Radiology went digital in about the year 2000 when the cost of printing out films for a CAT scan, which might, print, might produce 200 images, became prohibitive and the cost of digital storage fell and those two curves crossed and radiology went digital really over a few years in the U.S. Uh, to a system called PACS, uh, and I'm not sure if that's the same acronym you use, but essentially digital radiology. The gentleman I'm showing here, his name is Wally Miller. I, when I went to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, there was no question that the central hub of the hospital was not in the executive suite of the hospital or in the fanciest operating room. It was in the radiology reading room, at, particularly the chest reading room, where this uh, professor, Wally Miller, held court every day. And the reason this was so important was that every single day, the medical and the surgical teams came through the chest reading room, essentially like cars going through a car wash, one after another. We would sit down or stand behind Wally Miller, who was seated by a chair, in a chair, and Wally had that board behind him called an alternator where the films were, were stacked. And Wally put his foot on a, a, a button on the floor, and that, that uh, machine went around in circles until it came to your films, and then they were lit up with intense backlighting, and then Wally would say, tell me what the story is. And we would say, well, this is a 42-year-old woman with shortness of breath and a productive cough and a fever, and she has lupus. We think she probably has pneumonia. And Wally would look at the film and then say, nah, and he would then tell you why it didn't look like a garden variety pneumonia, but looked like a fungal infection or tuberculosis or cancer or whatever it was. The give and take during those discussions was fantastic. We learned things. The radiologists learned things because it was their connection to clinical medicine. And we came out of these meetings not only being smarter about the x-rays, but really having a, a real plan for what we were going to do that day. So not only were we doing radiology, but we were actually doing sense making. There was the kind of one moment of the day where we stopped, thought deeply about the case, talked about it with our radiology colleagues, and came out with a plan. Well, this is uh, another radiology professor. His name is uh, Paul Chang. He's a professor at the University of Chicago, and he was one of the early leaders in the uh, digitization of radiology, uh, the system called PACS. He's an informatics expert. Paul Chang's father is also a radiologist. And you would think that if your father was in your field uh, and you had become this famous professor kind of inventing this new way of doing radiology, that his father would be very proud of him. Paul Cheng's father's nickname for his son is the man who ruined radiology. And that is because the minute that radiology went digital, those wonderful rounds that we used to have with Wally Miller stopped. Nobody thought they were going to stop. I've gone back and read the literature to see if anybody anticipated that they were going to stop. Nothing. There was nobody who had an inkling that once radiology went digital and the clinicians could see the film, quote unquote, on the floor or at home, they no longer would have the need, the forcing function really, to go down to radiology to see the film, and those rounds just stopped. And the radiologists lament the fact that they no longer see the clinicians the way they once did. Many of the older clinicians, like me, lament the fact that we're not going to radiology anymore. But it was really quite striking and, and has not really been replicated in many places. Here's the messages and the lessons, I think, that we've seen from digital radiology, that the digitization of the thing, in this case the film, creates the opportunity for what the Silicon Valley types like to call infinite scalability and distribution, meaning it no longer needs to be in one place. It can be everywhere. Social relationships and communication patterns that previously depended on gathering around the thing may very well wither in ways that, it, in, at least in radiology, no one anticipated. Power relationships mediated by who controls the thing will be renegotiated. When there was only one version of the film and it lived in the in radiology world, well, it was pretty clear that you had to go down and talk to the radiologist who looked at the film, that the radiologist would be the only ones who could read the film. Well, now we're beginning to talk in the States about whether we really need the radiologist to do a second reading and bill for a reading when a neurologist looks at a CAT scan and is perfectly comfortable reading it. Uh, we're, of course, beginning to talk about and already talking about 
whether the radiologists still need to be in the building. Why don't they, why don't we have centralized outposts where they read it? And of course, the whole world is flat forces. We are seeing a phenomenon where we're saying, do the radiologists really need to be in the country? The average U.S. radiologist makes about $400,000 a year. The average radiologist in India makes about $40,000 a year. That was not an interesting comparison until very recently, but now that the film is digital, it's a very interesting comparison, especially since we're looking for ways of saving money. So these are all questions that arise once the thing goes digital. I think the x-ray is interesting, but not as interesting as what happens when the thing is not the film, it's the medical record. And so let me sort of turn to that. This is the, uh, the room at my hospital at UCSF Medical Center where the residents congregate to do their work. There are lots of computers. You can't see it from here, but there's a view out that window of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's very lovely. It's sort of a tribal hangout room where the residents do most of their work. That wouldn't bother me that much, except this is a picture of the ward, and, uh, and it wasn't hard to find the time where I could, uh, I could find no one in the picture. The nurses are still around, but the doctors who used to congregate around the chart rack in the nurses' station and stay there for several hours a day because that's where they read their notes, wrote their orders, read other physicians' notes. Uh, they no longer need to do that. They do it in that other room where they're hanging out with each other. So all of the work that we've done to try to improve teamwork between doctors and nurses has had a grenade thrown into the middle of it by virtue of the digitization of the chart. Did we think about that for more than a minute before we went digital? I can tell you we didn't. It, was, it sort of surprised us the same way that the end of radiology round surprised us. But I think if we were more thoughtful, it wouldn't surprise anyone. These are sort of expected consequences of creating a scalable medical record or, in the case of radiology, a film. Let me turn to the relationship. I've talked about the relationship uh, between clinicians or among clinicians. Let's turn to the relationship between doctors and patients. This is Abraham Verghese, an absolutely wonderful uh, physician and writer. You may have read some of his works. He coined the term the eye patient in 2008 in the New England Journal. And Abraham wrote, the patient is still at the center, but more as an icon for another entity clothed in binary garments, a wonderful turn of phrase, the eye patient. Often ER personnel have scanned, tested, and diagnosed so that the doctors, the interns, meet a fully formed eye patient long before they meet the real patient. The eye patient's blood counts and emanations are tracked and trended like a Dow Jones index. And pop-up flags remind the clinicians to feed or bleed. They are handily discussed in what he calls the bunker, the conference room, while the real patients keep the beds warm and ensure that the folders bearing their names stay alive on the computer. A wonderful cautionary note about something that's very real, that we're increasingly taking care of the digital version of the patient rather than the person. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. A seven-year-old girl went to see her pediatrician a few years ago and, and drew this, car, this absolutely charming crayon drawing of her recollection of the visit to the doctor. Here it is. You see in the middle of the picture the girl, next to her, her mother, her sister, and in the far corner with his back to the patient is the doctor smiling as he works on his computer. Uh, if this doesn't scare the hell out of you, it should, and it's very, very real. It's what patients are beginning to feel when they go to see doctors. I'm going to spend most of the rest of my time on a single case that happened at, at my institution, UCSF, uh, about two years ago that, uh, to me, made clear some of the patient safety challenges in computerization. Uh, again, the caveat being, or the cautionary note being, I don't want you to come away believing that I think that computers have made care less safe on average. I think that they have made care safer. And I think the evidence supports that, but they clearly have created new classes of, of medical errors that we need to begin addressing. Let me tell you what happened. A 16-year-old boy weighing 38.6 kilograms, for most of you that's familiar, for the U.S. I've got to translate that, it's about 80 pounds, with a chronic immunodeficiency, a genetic immunodeficiency, was admitted to our hospital for a colonoscopy as part of a workup for gastrointestinal bleeding. He was on multiple home medicines, including trimethoprim sulfa, 160 milligram tablet twice a day for prophylaxis, a common antibiotic. In the U.S., we call it either Septra or Bactrim. I think you call it often co-trimoxazole. Uh, the medical center had recently installed the state-of-the-art electronic health record computerized order entry system. Our system is called EPIC. It's by far the most uh, prevalent system in the United States and generally considered to be the best, at least for large hospitals. Nine of the 
uh, top 10 as rated by U.S. News and World Reports, nine of the top 10 hospitals, including my own, uh, now use this particular system called EPIC. At 1.09 in the afternoon, the admission orders were written, including an order to administer 38 and one-half Septra tablets. Remember the correct dose was one, not 38 and a half. In case you're multitasking and looking at your email, I want to reemphasize that. At one in, one in the afternoon, the orders were written to administer to this 16-year-old child 38 pills. Nine hours later, he took this dose. 14 hours later, he had a grand mal seizure, a code blue was called. A week later, he left our intensive care unit. Thankfully, he's doing well today, and I suspect will never have a urinary infection for the rest of his life. It's quite logical for you to wonder how this would happen. Let me dissuade you from doing something that I think is, is normally human, which is to say, what kind of morons must those people have been? The doctor, the nurse, the pharmacist. I can tell you these are good, smart, careful people. My hospital, UCSF Medical Center, is, 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 is commonly ranked within the top 10 of the 5,000 hospitals in the United States. It's a fabulous place. And the medical record and the electronic health record and computerized ordering system we have is by far seen as the best system that a lot of money can buy. Costs us about $300 uh, uh, million, dollars, if I recall. So let's go and, and, and do the root cause analysis. How did this happen? The resident wanted to order the dose the patient had been on for several years, one double strength septra twice a day. That's what it looks like. That was the resident knew what the patient was on and knew that's what he or she, I believe, intended for the dose to be. Here's the order screen from Epic. I show it to you with the permission of the company uh, because there's a contract that says we're not allowed to show it without getting their permission, uh, another issue. And here's what the order looks like. Now, we have created a rule. One of the things that happens when you computerize is you have to come up with standard formats and standard work for things that in the past you did a lot of different ways. One, one standard rule we came up with was for kids weighing less than 40 kilograms, you must use weight-based dosing. Now, you might say maybe that should have been 30 kilograms or 20, but at some point you have to make a decision, when do you need to use weight-based dosing in children? And, and in many ways, one of the safety features of the computer is to use weight-based dosing and have it automatically calculate the correct dose because it knows what the weight is. We made a policy decision that any kid less than 40 kilograms, we use weight-based dosing. You remember this, this uh, teenager weighed 38.6 kilograms, meaning that the doctor was not allowed to prescribe the dose that she knew he was on, which was one pill twice a day. How do you do weight-based dosing in EPIC? This is what it looks like. She clicks five milligrams per kilogram of trimethoprim because it's double strength. It populates the field there, five milligrams per kilogram of trimethoprim does some calculation and says that equals 193 milligrams of trimethoprim. The tablet size is 160, so we'd have to round it off to one tablet. She then clicks uh, to accept that order, believing that she has now signed an order for one tablet, which is precisely what she wanted to do. If she had been correct about that, then all would have been well, but she was not. Let me tell you why. We have another rule. Again, you're going to have to create all these rules when you computerize, and, and, uh, and, and, and the rules were created by good, smart clinicians and informatics experts. The next rule is that, poli that by policy, doses that are rounded by more than 5% must be confirmed and signed by the ordering physician, meaning that if the weight-based uh, dose uh, calculates out to 193 milligrams, which is what was true here, and the pill size is 160, that's a 17% difference, the pharmacy is not allowed to simply approve that. They have to go back to the doctor and ask, are you sure that's what you want? I don't think that's a ridiculous rule because you can imagine a time where it's being rounded down from 193 to 160, and the doctor would say, no, no, I actually would like it rounded up, or let's, can we give one and a half tablets? And so that's the policy. This is what happened. The pharmacist text message to the doctor with this text, the dose is rounded by more than 5%. The correct dose is 160. Please reorder. The doctor goes back to the screen and types in 160, and I can't see all of you, so I'll ask you to, to uh, rhetorically ask, do you notice a problem there? And I'm hoping as some of you look at the screen, you do notice a problem, and I see some folks saying yes. There is the problem right there. The problem is 
that if the last time you were on the screen, you were on milligrams per kilogram mode, Epic assumes that if you go back to that, that screen for the same patient, you probably still want to be on milligrams per kilogram. That's not an unreasonable choice. It would certainly be a safer choice than automatically switching to milligram mode. But in that choice, we now have a physician ordering not 160 milligrams, which is her intent, but 160 milligrams per kilogram. I've shown this screen to audiences of probably two or 3,000 people over the last year, asked people to raise their hand if they're 100% sure they would have noticed that, and I've not seen somebody raise their hand. And if you say, yeah, of course I would have, remember this is a doctor on a busy floor, the beeper going off constantly, admitting two or three patients, each of whom are on 10 to 15 different medicines. It does say that she's about to order 38.5 tablets. She didn't notice that, and she clicked to sign. Now, Epic, of course, fires an alert that says that that's an overdose, but this is what the alert looks like. To me, it's extraordinarily text-heavy. The word overdose is kind of embedded in the middle, and I will tell you that this alert looks essentially the same as the alert that says it's a 1% overdose or the alert that says these two medications might interact but rarely do or the alert that says don't give this medicine with grapefruit juice. There's no gradations of the alert or very little gradations, no graphics to illustrate that, there's, that this is a very different alert, one for a 39-fold overdose, and you should pay attention. She overrides the warning, not unexpectedly. I, we asked her at the root cause meeting, you know, why did you override the alert? She said, when I came to UCSF, I was getting three or four alerts almost on every patient I saw, and I turned to my resident and I said, how do you get your work done? The resident said, just ignore the alerts. Now, uh, just to spend a second on alert fatigue, at UCSF in a month, we prescribe about 300,000 medications. The pharmacist get alerts on 150,000 of them. That, that's correct, 150,000. The doctor's on about 20,000. That's just the computerized alerts. In a month in our intensive care units at UCSF, Across 70 ICU beds, the ICU monitors, the ones that measure heart rate and blood pressure and oxygen saturation, throw off 2.5 million alerts. So we have clearly not addressed this issue of alert fatigue, and clinicians are doing something that's quite expected, which is not paying any attention to the alerts because so many of them are false positive signals. The doctor has now signed an order for 38 and a half pills. The order goes back to the pharmacy where the pharmacists are working in conditions that are, look very much like what I've shown in the picture here. It's cramped. They're multitasking while they're dealing with alerts on every other medicine. They're also answering the phone, answering the door, multitasking. The pharmacist received a signed order back from the physician. Remember, the pharmacist had just sent a text message to the doctor saying, order 160. The order comes back with the number 160, and the pharmacist also does not notice milligrams per kilogram, approves the order, gets an alert, and overrides it. So now you have an active order that's been endorsed by the doctor and the pharmacist. In the old days, now a label would have been printed out of a label printer. A pharmacy tech would have seen the label to, to dispense 38 and a half Sceptra tablets, would have taken a, a, a jar of Sceptra, started pouring them out. About halfway through, probably would have said, what the hell? Stopped and tapped the pharmacist on the shoulder and said, are you sure this is what you meant? But that's not what happens anymore. Let me introduce you to our robot. This is a $7 million pharmacy robot that uh, when it gets an order for 38 and a half pills, it says thank you in robot language and pulls them out of the shelves, barcodes them, shrink wraps them, puts them on little plastic rings, and does that with absolute precision. And that is, in fact, what it did, and that is what 38 and a half pills, barcoded, shrink wrapped, look like. They were put by the robot into a little bin, put in a van, because it's in a remote location, sent to the hospital where they came to rest, to, to rest in, the, uh, in the medication machine on the floor where the patient was, where a young nurse saw an order in her electronic medical record to deliver to this kid 38 and one-half pills. As it happened, she was in her first year working at UCSF and was floating, which means that she normally worked in the pediatric ICU, but there was a, a nurse who was out that day, so she was sent to work on a floor that she'd never worked on before, the general pediatrics floor, which doubled as a research floor. 
She thought this seemed like an unusually large dose, 38 and a half pills, but she'd never given Ceftra pills before. In the ICU, she'd only given it in intravenous form. She considered asking her charge nurse, but her charge nurse was off giving chemotherapy to another patient. She didn't want to bother her. She also was feeling some time pressure to move along because one of the things the computer can do is it knows exactly when every medication is given, and when you're more than 30 minutes late, there's a little annoying banner that comes up on your screen saying that you're late, move along. She considered asking the patient's mother, who was usually by the patient's bedside, but as luck would have it, this day the patient's brother, who has the same genetic illness, was also sick and was on another floor of our hospital, so the mom was out of the room. And she sat there looking at 38 and a half pills, wondering, but then saying to herself, well, I know to get to me it had to go through the doctor, had to go through the pharmacist, to go through the robot, so it's probably right, and I'll go ahead and barcode it, as I now do with all my medications. And so she takes out the barcode, and she barcodes pill number one. And all of you can probably guess what happened. When she barcodes pill number one, the barcode machine says, that's not right, I need to see 37 and a half more. Because by that stage of the medication safety process, the job of the barcode is to defend the order and to make sure the nurse gives the order as it's written. Now, how crazy is this dose? This would be like seeing a speed limit sign that said the speed limit is 2,500 miles per hour, rather than in the U.S. the typical speed limit is 65 or 60 miles per hour. It's a ridiculous dose, and when I asked the nurse about this in retrospect, of course she realized that, but at that moment, the barcode uh, confirmation was just one more piece of data that said to a young nurse, unfamiliar with the floor she was on, unsure of her skills, feeling some uh, pressure to move things along, that was just enough data for her to say, I guess it must be right. What does 38 and a half pills look like? That's what it looks like. I, I didn't have any uh, Ceptra at, at my house, so these are my, uh, my adult vitamins that I take, but about the same pill size. That's what it looks like. And she gave this to this child who had his seizure. What are the lessons from the case? Well, you've probably come up with many of them uh, yourself. You're all well familiar with the Swiss cheese model uh, uh, invented by uh, Jim Reason for Manchester that basically says in complex organizations there are layers of protection that all have holes, and when we see a, an accident in a complex organization, usually the problem is that the holes align and the error made it through. You could all come up with the holes here. Here are a few of them. We've created policies, well-meaning policies, but in retrospect took what should have been a completely straightforward act of giving the kid the one pill twice a day we knew he was on and added additional complexity. We also decided not to build in any hard stops. Why? Because in a complex research-oriented institution like ours, we're sometimes giving a lot of odd doses, and we were, we were recommended by the company not to build in any hard stops. We've obviously rethought that. Alert fatigue I've already gone through. Confirmation bias. People expected to see 160, and so they saw it. A stressed workforce, difficult working conditions, lots of production pressure on the part of everyone. Over-reliance on the machine, a, a very typical problem that we see in, in, in industries that go, that computerize is over time people start turning off their own uh, instinct and begin to trust the machine when it tells you something, even when your gut is telling you that it, this is a weird, odd order. Aviation has gone through some of this itself where, where some of the crashes, unfortunately, well, the, the one we just heard about in France seems to have another terrible uh, background and reason. But other crashes, including the cra crash of Air France 447 off the coast of Brazil five years ago, that's part of the problem that the machines, when they either stopped working or gave unreliable data, people were so reliant on it they didn't know what to do, or the machine confirmed something that in your gut you think is wrong, but you believe the machine rather than your own instinct. Very importantly, one of the things we learned from this was this whole issue of a stop-the-line culture. For the first 10 years in patient safety, we talked about authority gradients and will people speak up to that senior surgeon if they're lower on the totem pole. I think one of the things that's fascinating here is we have a new authority gradient. It's the person versus the machine. Will someone speak up when the machine is telling them something that they think might be wrong? And the answer in this case was no. That's how we ended up giving a 39-fold overdose of an antibiotic. In the last minute or two, kind of what do we need to do? Well, plenty and a lot of, uh, on this in, in, in my book, but just in, in shorthand, I'd say 
the computer manufacturers, at least the ones we're familiar with in the U.S., have not sufficiently used principles of user-centered design. I spent a day in researching my book with uh, Boeing engineers in Seattle, and the principles of user-centered design are absolutely baked into the way they think about cockpit design. They wouldn't dream of sending a plane out to be used until they'd spend hundreds and hundreds of hours watching the pilots interact with the technology and changing the design based on that feedback. In healthcare information technology, that kind of feedback loop is, it has been used uh, insufficiently for reasons that I think are clear but have to be built into the way we design our systems. It's not all the vendor's problem. We have to think more deeply about the way we develop our processes. So the fact that the notes now are, are, are almost indecipherable because they're so filled with copy and pasted garbage in many cases, it's not so much a technology problem. It's teaching people how to write a good note in a digital environment. We have to improve our communication. Some of that's technology, but some of it is reimagining what should radiology rounds look like in a digital era? Do we have to go down to radiology, or can we do that through Skype now? You know, who knows, but we have to start asking these questions, and I don't think we've asked them sufficiently. Alert fatigue, a huge issue. One of the reasons I'm talking about this case with you is we have to talk with each other about IT-related issues. And finally, in the U.S., the federal government got very involved in, and in pretty deeply into the minutia of what our IT systems would look like, in part because they were doling out $30 billion and they felt an obligation to do that. That was understandable, but now federal regulations in the U.S. are too deeply embedded in the process of technology. The federal government can't regulate what a technology tool has to look like. It's, it has to be too nimble and too innovative to get that done, and I think the federal government needs to pull back. The model in the U.S., at least, is the Internet, where our federal government was very much involved in the early days of the formation of the Internet, but then has pulled way back, and the Internet is largely managed privately and by not-for-profits, and I think that's partly why it's been so remarkably successful. Let me end with this. Uh, this is Ron Heifetz, who's a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and Heifetz talks about adaptive versus technical problems. Technical problems are problems that are sort of can be solved with a cookbook approach. You have a recipe, you follow it, and everything comes out right. And I think IT in the rest of our life has become a technical problem. When I download a, an app on my iPhone, I don't have to read the instructions anymore. It's so clear, you just follow the instructions and it's all good. And I think we believe that healthcare IT was yet another technical problem, but that is totally incorrect. It is an adaptive problem of the highest order. And Heifetz wrote that adaptive problems are those that require people themselves to change. In adaptive problems, the people are the problem and the people are the solution. And leadership is about mobilizing and engaging the people with the problem rather than trying to anesthetize them so that we can go off or so that you can go off and solve it on your own. I think that was our flaw. I think we didn't understand the complexity of this. And the, the, the solution here, and I believe we will solve this, but the solution is a little bit in making the technology better and much, much more in reimagining our work, our culture, our training, our processes of care in a digital environment. I think if we do that, we can get this right, but it's going to take some hard work and work that I think we've only just begun. Let me stop there, and I look forward to your, uh, to your questions and comments, and really thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. That was astounding. And you can tell from the chat in the chat box that uh, you've struck a chord with many uh, during your talk, and Heifetz is a great place to stop. Now, let me bring back in uh, Laura. Welcome again to the call, Laura. Thanks, Brian. You, you, you want to ask a question of Bob? Uh, yeah, which Bob may have just addressed, but I'll ask anyway. Um, given that health as an industry has been relatively slower at integrating information and communication technology than other areas of industry, do you see a time when we will drop the E in electronic health and consider technology everyday business? of health delivery and what would help that? Yeah, I, 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 I think that's, that's the right goal and, and that technology in some ways becomes uh, a tool and becomes just part of the way we do our work and an enabler of it, not an, not an end in itself, but a means toward certain ends. In the U.S., this question, I think, is, is very much front of mind because, as I mentioned, the U.S. government has, has created a very prescriptive regulatory environment for technology tools, which I think at this moment is, is actually more harmful than helpful. And 
I think many of us believe that now that everybody has computers, what the U.S. should be doing is shifting toward the end goals, the triple aim type goals. You know, we are trying to create a, set or, a series of incentives that drive healthcare delivery systems to produce the best care, highest quality, safest, most satisfying to patients at the lowest cost, and leave it up to the organizations and the individuals to figure out what technology tools they need to have to meet those, those end goals. So not to prescribe, you know, that you need to use this system or that system or it has to do this or that, to really prescribe what are the goals we're all trying to achieve and then leave it up to end users and the technology industry to come up with the tools that help us to meet those goals. I think the federal government in the U.S. was right to create the incentive system because for lots of reasons we weren't naturally going digital. But now that we have, I think that we should be thinking about the end goals rather than focusing on the, the precise specs of the technology. Thank you very much for that, Bob, and thanks for your question, Laura. Uh, we also have a question from our friend Camila, who's been chatting away, uh, from ProQualis, uh, a not-for-profit organization supporting quality improvement in Brazil. Um, and uh, Camila sent this uh, question in before the, the, uh, the conference uh, this afternoon, Bob. She asks, Middle-income countries like Brazil have been slower than the U.S. in adopting health IT. What would your advice be as we move forward in this endeavor, considering a resource-constrained environment and the fact that basic information is frequently missing from patient records? Well, I thank you for the question. And I, I really do have a belief that we have to go through this stage to switch from analog to digital. And I think in some ways, you know, as much in middle-income countries, and uh, I think everybody has to get there. There's a little bit of revisionist history in the United States that says one of the mistakes of the $30 billion incentive program in 2008-2009 was that the systems were not ready. Uh, well, they were never going to get ready until we began using them and pushing back on them and going through the iterative cycles that we see in every industry. I think the, you know, the advantage in some ways of being a later adopter, and it's understandable in a middle-income country that these are expensive systems, is that the systems will get cheaper in the United States and in other uh, wealthier countries. And then uh, I think that, that there will be uh, more uh, available systems at lower cost. So in the U.S., for example, until fairly recently, if you were a hospital or a clinic, you tended to buy a very expensive system uh, built on servers that needed to, to live in your building, and you needed to have a huge number of IT staff. Well, now we're beginning to see systems, uh, one that I profile in the book by a company called Athena, uh, that's a cloud-based system, meaning that you just pay a monthly fee and, they, and you don't have any servers, and it really works sort of like your Gmail or your Dropbox it's being developed and improved all the time by a company that's watching the behavior and the needs of all of its users. And I think once you have that kind of scalability and cloud-based system, I think the cost will come down significantly. Another thing that I think will make this all less costly is up until now, at least in the U.S., for a big hospital like mine, you, know, you almost needed to go with a very expensive system that did everything, hospital, clinic, blood bank, population health, I think we're going to see, with some pressure from the federal government, um, more modular systems, systems that are open to outside applications. Uh, the, the big vendors up until recently have thought that. It's not been in their business interest to have open systems that communicate with each other and that accept third-party apps. But I think that ecosystem is going to change over the next several years, and if that happens, I think you'll see more modular solutions and solutions that will be less expensive. The final thought, though, is there was a study from RAND that said that adoption of computerized entry, order entry and electronic health records in the U.S. would save $81 billion per year in the United States. So far, those savings have been elusive, and that's not unexpected. There was a, a very important concept in, in technology called the productivity paradox, and what that means is in most industries, you see projections of major improvements in productivity that look like all you have to do is turn the switch on and it'll happen tomorrow. And the paradox is generally you don't see those productivity gains for on average 10, sometimes even more, 10 to 15 years. And the reason is the technology needs to mature, but more importantly, 
the work processes and the training and the culture have to change around the technology. So all these issues I've talked about today, I think are the stage that we're going through. You know, we've really just gone digital over the last three to five years, and it's not surprising to me that we haven't seen massive productivity gains. I think that in years five to 10, we will. And for countries that are very cognizant of the money that they have to spend, I think there will be a business case that if you can figure out ways to go digital uh, over, a over a shorter time horizon, because I think we'll begin figuring this out, over a shorter time horizon, there will be a business case that if you, go, if you go digital, you will actually save money. You just can't expect to do it in the first year or two. Well, thanks very much for that. And I've got a whole series of comments about the, uh, the piece that you described, the radiologist. Many people uh, uh, talking about the importance of uh, teams coming together. Fiona Fraser, project lead from NHS Education Scotland, saying just how precious it was and important it was for teams to come together. Uh, Dr. Brian Anderson, a new board member here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, agreed wholeheartedly with that. And Francis Elliott, medical director at NHS Fife, asks, related to the same theme, so how do we maintain the socialization we need in medicine as we embark on digital technology? Well, it's a wonderful question. I get, and I think my, my main response to that is, is think about the end goal of what you're trying to achieve. Don't necessarily get too nostalgic and say, we need to bring back radiology rounds, because the way to do that might be a new digitally enabled way of connecting people. It may be that we Skype with each other and some, some new gizmo allows the radiologist to show us what's happening on the screen you know, through the computer. It's not necessarily that you say it, this has to go back and look like what it looked like during my training, but it does have to be to say that we've lost something important in those human connections. How do we re-envision them? I think in our case, part of the mistake was we built that room where the residents hang out with each other, and it's, it's a couple of floors away from where the, uh, where the patients are being taken care of. If we had it over to do, uh, to do over again today, we would have built that room right next to the floor. And so some of it is sort of thinking about the geography and the physical space. Some of it is thinking about the technology. But very important to say, what have we lost? How do we, re how do we get it back? Not necessarily looking exactly the way it used to be, but maybe in a new, more modern way. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Bob. Now, a question here from David Grayson, our friend from Coavatea in New Zealand, where, where it was 5 a.m. at the start of this call. So welcome to the call, David. David says, how well is our education of healthcare workers in, in training and adapting to this new world of digitized medicine? Yeah, I, I think we, I, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I can tell you in the U.S., we haven't even begun to address this. I think we have... We've kept our educational models just the way they've always been. We've expected that people would learn. Certainly young people are comfortable with technology. We've expected that they would learn to use the technology and integrate it into their work, and that's probably true. But to the degree that we need to rethink the work, we need to rethink the training as well. I'll give you one example, and I mentioned it already, that in the U.S. at least we are seeing clinician notes that are now largely worthless because it's very easy to copy and paste yesterday's note into today's note and then copy and paste the labs and the x-rays and all of a sudden you have a 15-page note and it's impossible to figure out what's going on with the patient. Uh, and there have been people who say, well, the, the IT vendors have to fix that. Well, yeah, probably a little bit, but we also have to train people to write a good note in the digital in environment. Just because you can copy and paste in all of these things it doesn't mean you should or you must. And those kinds of training issues, you know, really saying what is the work, what have we lost, how do we train people to do it correctly in this new environment, I think we're pretty far behind on. We're just beginning to address it now. Thank you very much for that. Now, just as probably a yes or no answer, this is a question from uh, Aziz Sheikh, Professor of uh, Research and Development, uh, Primary Care in the University of Edinburgh, and a Harkness Fellow with David Bates in uh, Brigham and Women's in Boston uh, last year. Uh, Aziz asks, thank you for an excellent presentation, Bob. Would greater regulation of health IT be helpful or would this stifle innovation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have, should have given you that. So, so would, it, would it be helpful or would it stifle? It's both too much and too little. It's too much as it gets prescriptive about how we're going to use the tools and what the fonts and colors should be. 
It's too little in that one of the key things is that all of we, we need interoperability. We need all of the systems to create a single database and have data about patients flow across systems and have researchers be able to access big data across many systems. I think the only entity that can make that happen is a government because it's a public good and it may not be in the interest of individual vendors to make that happen or even individual healthcare delivery systems. So I think that needs more regulation, but the prescriptiveness of what your system does and what it looks like needs less. Thank you very much for that, Bob. And thank you for a wonderful presentation and for everyone for their chat. I'll just finish, Bob, just by quoting, thank you for the advanced copy of the book. In chapter nine, your, your chapter is about can computers replace the physician's brain? And you use this wonderful quote, any doctor who could be replaced by a computer should be. So we'll leave that bit of humor uh, hanging there. And Bob, thank you very much indeed for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Rick. Um, now, folks, we've come to the top of the hour. Just to remind you, our next uh, speaker on QI Connect is uh, Professor Martin Marshall, Professor of Healthcare Improvement at University College London. You have the time there. We'll be tweeting more about that. And to remind you again of the wonderful uh, array of uh, international speakers we have for our 2015 uh, lineup. And finally, we'll finish on the reminding you to uh, use Twitter at a uh, HISQI Connect. So thank you again, Bob. Thank you for all the participants and everyone here uh, to make this a wonderful experience this afternoon. Have a great day, everyone.